Hello everyone. Welcome to the fifth session of the TAIC 2020 webinar series. Today our speaker for the webinar is Professor Padma Sarangpani. She is the chairperson of the Center for Education, Innovation and Action Research at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She is leading the Connected Learning Initiative project that has been awarded the Open Education Consortium Award for OER collaboration in 2019 and the UNESCO King Hamad Prize for use of ICTs in education in the year 2018. She has led initiatives to develop programs of professional capacity building, including blended master's programs and an innovative program for initial teacher preparation and short term program for in service teacher professional development using ICT. She has also contributed to the NCF 2005, the revised centrally sponsored scheme for teacher education 2015 and the MHRD guidelines for BRCs and CRCs. We are indeed fortunate to have you here with us, ma'am. I now invite you to start the session. Thank you. I was just saying that I'm very pleased to be a part of the seminar series and um, good morning to everybody. Opportunity. Uh, I have been increasingly feeling and thinking that philosophy of education and we ourselves as, as educators need to be engaged with the question of self and society uh, using a political lens. And more recently, I've also begun to think about the importance of the idea of culture in how we think of ourselves and society and what politics is a lot about. Uh, the idea of culture is very central. So that's really what I'm going to pick as the topic for discussion today. Yeah. So I've selected for reading um, three texts which I shared with you uh, in advance. And I added a fourth text as I prepared for the talk today. Um, of course, the Constitution of India, because I think it's a grounding political framework uh, and, in, and exemplifies uh, some of the key values for which uh, we are constructing a new culture and key values around which inform the polity which is being shaped in India and for which we all strive. I'm increasingly aware that no nation is an achieved state and uh, we cannot place it as something that we have achieved in the past and move on from it. But these are ideas that we need to constantly reaffirm, rediscover the meaning of in our lives, uh, constantly being challenged and revised. And today I want to reflect a little bit about why this discussion around the core values of even something like a constitution are forever re-entering into the debate requiring to be shaped all the time. And I also want to think about why we as teachers, as educators are especially concerned with uh, such core political values that inform the imagination of the nation. Along with this reading, as I plan and worked for today's talk, I, uh, I went back to what is worth teaching by Krishna Kumar, uh, my teacher. I hope many of you have read this uh, very important essay that he wrote um, more than 30 years ago, examining the question of how we make decisions about what is worth teaching. Uh, I also shared with you an essay by Rajiv Bhargav that I have found very useful in thinking about the question of culture in society and why the question of culture is such an important question um, for all of us to engage with. Uh, his, this essay is from his book, um, edited book, Multiculturalism, Liberalism and Democracy. And all these three ideas of multiculturalism or pluralism as we've talked about it in India, liberalism, which is the constitutive character of our constitution, and democracy, which is the form of governance that we have adopted, Bhargav provides us with very powerful ways of re-engaging with these ideas. Uh, finally, I also shared with you an essay that uh, I wrote for a, a conference two years ago on the idea of India. And this was an essay which I called Culture and School in which I reflected on what schools need to be doing about culture and how the question of culture enters into our lives. Yeah. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to examine some of the key concepts which inform our political culture. I'm going to engage with the question of why curriculum decision making needs to be what Krishna Kumar calls a deliberative process. It's actually 
this idea of deliberation is so central in any democratic process. And I want to dwell a little bit about this idea of deliberation. And I want to think about why this matters to teachers and educators. In other words, I feel that we as teachers and educators are especially invested in the formation of a political culture more than just our interest in it as citizens. All of us as citizens of a democratic uh, society are and must be engaged with questions of the political culture in which we live. But teachers and educators, we have a special responsibility towards it. And I want to think about that question again today. So in this essay, What is Worth Teaching, uh, Krishna Kumar um, asked this question about how are we going to go about deciding what we should put into the curriculum? What considerations will inform what we decide to do um, and pick to include in a, in a curriculum? And so I've put up some questions there. Let's just think about them. And um, if any of you have some thoughts on any of these questions, six questions. Do you think that all students should learn mathematics? Please you know, type your answers in the chat box. I'll be curious to know. Yeah. Jigyasa, why do you think all mathematics many students find mathematics difficult to comprehend uh, very very abstract uh, in fact not related to everyday life they're not very sure whether everybody must learn mathematics it's a part of life so yes we need some basic mathematics maybe we need to be able to add subtract handle money but how much mathematics do we need to learn does everybody need to learn integration should everybody learn about algebra? Is it relevant for everyone? Yeah. So I, as I can already see in the chat box, yeah, many of you are saying hmm, basic mathematics is important, but everybody may not need it. Again, if in a family, one or two people are good at basic mathematics, maybe that's enough for the family. Why does everybody have to learn it? Is it essential for everybody to know everything which is considered as basic? In fact, one of my colleagues at this, uh, Professor Denzel Saldana, he researched literacy in a tribal community in Thane. And he found that among the tribals, it was enough if a few tribals were literate. They didn't regard literacy as essential for everybody to know. They said, if a few people are literate, that's good enough. All of us benefit from a few people being literate. So you can see that some, even something as fundamental as, lit, as literacy, which all of us will assume everybody should know, it's a mixed response because there are people who feel that when there's a good, well-knit community, then knowledge which is known by a few is shared among everybody. So it's not important for everyone to know even what we consider as basic. So, Clearly, the questions of what we decide to select and include in a curriculum are far from obvious. We may say that in earlier societies where families were close-knit, maybe it was enough if a few people became uh, knowledgeable and others could benefit from the knowledge that a few had. And as society changes, then the requirement for what everybody needs to know also shifts and changes. So clearly, none of these questions of what is worth teaching, what must be transmitted to the next generation, these are not questions for which the answers are obvious. Um, sometimes we feel, and Krishna Kumar in his essay beautifully lays out these two pathways, which have often, people have looked at these two pathways as helping us make these decisions about what is worth teaching. Some educators have felt that psychology is a good source. It can help us decide um, you know, what needs to be taught to young children, what age they are ready to learn algebra, what age of and what level of cognitive development they will be ready to engage with a second language or a third language, and that psychology can help us decide. Kumar points out that psychology may help us decide when or how to do something, but it will not really help us answer the question of whether it is worth doing in the first place. So the question of curriculum is really a question of worthiness of knowledge to be included. And the reason why it becomes a problem 
is because there's only so much time that's available in a in a school, in a class, in a year. And so everything that we, whatever we decide to include, it is at the expense of something else which gets left out or excluded. So we are always making selection. And clearly there will be a lot of debate about how much is important, what is the most important thing to do, whether ideas are equally important for inclusion. And people can have very different views about uh, the question of importance, significance, and worthiness of selection. Krishna Kumar also points out that we can look at the intrinsic worth of things and you know examine it, their truth value. That we may say that it's important for all students to know the basic truths about society and humanity. Uh, but the basic truth question is again very tricky because um, it comes from certain subjective positions, the question of truth. And even if things are true, they may not be important. So still the question of importance and worthiness, we can't escape from that question in any question of selection from curriculum. So, so how do we then decide what to select and include in a curriculum? I've you included this uh, picture from the Indian Constituent Assembly. And those of you who know how, I mean, all of you, would have read about how the Indian constitution got constructed and that it took a lot of time. In fact, the, the debates of the Constituent Assembly are a very, very important source uh, for us to understand the extent to which if included in the constitution was deliberated upon. And also every single idea which was left out was also deliberated upon. So inclusion and exclusion was a very, very complex, invested, debated question. There was a lot of debate about whether we should, in our constitution, name Hindi as the national language and require everybody to know it. A lot of debate about it. And finally, although it was clear to the members of the Constituent Assembly that it was very desirable for India to have a common language other than English, the Constituent Assembly couldn't reach a consensus on whether that language should be Hindi. Some people argued that this is the language spoken by the majority, but several members in the Constitution were against even anything which is spoken by the majority as automatically being imposed on everybody. They said that there is no grounds in a democracy that the values, beliefs, and practices of a majority automatically apply will apply on everybody. So clearly, the process of decision making was very complex and very important things on which consensus could not be achieved were actually either left out of the constitution or place and directive principles or set as goals to which we will work as a polity. We can't have it today, but you will try to work towards it kind of uh, formulation. So, even something like a constitution, we can see in the construction of a constitution in a democracy that the key element which enables us to arrive at this binding uh, value framework, which will hold us all together as a people, is arrived at through a process of deliberation. And de deliberation, therefore, is probably the most important uh, uh, characteristics characteristic of a, of a democratic process. And deliberation means the willingness to speak about it, the willingness to uh, make arguments in favor of, defend, provide evidence, reconsider, negotiate. All these are the terms of deliberation. It's careful consideration, examining an issue from many points of view, and with an openness that you will change your mind if need be, or you will arrive at a consensus, which is like a working formula. It's a pragmatic decision for this point of time, but as and when we can return to the debate, we will revise, we will return, because some of these questions are not decided and settled. Democracy has this quality and this characteristics. In fact, this is what makes democracy so valuable as a process. There may be a few people who think, I know, and I know that I'm right. 
democracy just reminds us that there are people on the other side as well who equally are confident that they know and they know that what they know is right so clearly the question of what is right and wrong is a question it is from perspective it's a perspectival thing it's from where you stand and look and democracy requires that you concede that others may also be confident about the position from which they speak and um, from which they uh, argue for what they believe is valuable this process is deeply invested some of us hold on to our values very deeply we call them values we call them constitutive beliefs because we want, we're not going to give them up easily we're not just going to be brushed aside by somebody who claims to be an expert or somebody who claims to be more experienced than us or who is who says that i know better than you you're not intelligent democracy just tells us hey hang on there are many points of view and everybody is entitled to have their point of view but at the end of the day we have to come to some working consensus to get ahead with the job so democracy also enjoins on us that requirement it's not like you know everybody just goes on their own way holding on to their own beliefs but we have to come to some agreements about how we're going to work together and create our own common self identity so this is the character of deliberation and democracy and krishna kumar reminds us that the process of curriculum construction is no less deliberative than any political process in a democracy and when i say that it's a deliberative process please don't think that i am uh, unnecessarily complicating uh, curricular questions if you stop and think about many uh items that have staked a claim to entering into the curriculum you will understand immediately how contested and uh, difficult and deliberative truly in the deepest sense of political deliberation curriculum decisions basically are um whether it is a question of whether we should have three languages or two languages in the school curriculum whether andhra pradesh government is right in making english Uh, the compulsory medium of instruction and equally making telugu the compulsory second language in schools is this a correct curricular decision it takes us back i mean we the, it is clearly a process of uh, of deliberation we can see that every change that we bring about in our school curriculum immediately uh, lays before us uh, the evidence that this is Uh, as complex a deliberative process as any political process is in a democracy you may say that look we just spend so much time debating on what is worth doing and what to include in the curriculum and we neglect questions of how to do it well and how to ensure that all children learn can't we just accept some things as obvious and just get on with the job well it can't be as simple as that because always there are very strong positions about what is worth doing and so people who believe deeply in uh, in particular points of view are not going to give in to debate very easily and just let the others get on with the job i think we shouldn't be apprehensive about this character of curriculum and as we progress with this um webinar today i hope that uh, you will begin to think about why this is uh i mean begin to understand why curriculum decisions are so contested why they are basically political in their character and why this is in fact a very valuable and important uh, quality uh, of curriculum decision making and how it actually makes the entire process of teaching learning alive a live process and places great responsibility on teachers and also requires that teachers be professionally equipped to engage with this kind of decision making Uh, Kumar calls a curriculum deliberation a social dialogue, and he says the wider the reach of this dialogue, the stronger its grasp is on the social conditions in which it is to function. The more enriched the deliberation will be, and the more likely we are that we will have consensus on the final curriculum. If just a few people get together and make decisions, others may not agree. to these decisions and they at the earliest opportunity may want to change these decisions so the wider the deliberation is 
the deeper the engagement with the process of deliberation is, the more likely we are that we will arrive at a consensus which will hold for some length of time. And ultimately, the choice of what we include in as knowledge, what we decide to call as knowledge, and the way in which we structure it depends on our own perception of how important it is with reference to the milieu and with reference to our own vision of the role of education in relation to this milieu. Um, milieu meaning the social context in which we live. So what is the role that education has in the milieu becomes the central decision-making point, which then informs how we decide what to include and how we decide how to structure what will go into the curriculum. So in, in that sense, it is a social dialogue. Um, I was fortunate to be a part of the NCF 2005, and during that period, um, I, I, I certainly felt that Krishna Kumar and Professor Yashpal deepened the process of curriculum decision making and truly gave it the character of social dialogue. The, the way we therefore think about curriculum today, post the NCF 2005, is different from the way in which curriculum decision making obtained in India prior to that. One point of view is that let the experts decide because experts know. And the other point of view is let society decide because ultimately education uh, as a fundamental right is what a society gives to itself. So in that sense, let society decide. Well, whether both routes are possible, it's not as if every country in the world goes the society decide, decides route. Many people go the experts decide route. And it really depends on what are the political arrangements in the country. What are the aims of education in that nation? Uh, on the level of education that we're speaking about and whether education is a right or whether it's compulsory. For example, if we're talking about university education, uh, which position are, are you likely to go with? Are you likely to, should curriculum of university, undergraduate or postgraduate education be decided by society? Or should experts be making these decisions? But what is your sense? Any points of view on this? Jyoti feels both. Why both, uh, Jyoti? Please type your answers. I'd like to see how, what role would society have to play in university education? Why should society, what is the justification for society to Lakshmi feels experts should have a view. Lakshmi, would you like to just elaborate on why you think experts are? So some of you feel that we need to know what society's expectations are. We need to know why does society want secondary um, postgraduate education or graduate education. We might even say that, look, ultimately higher education is being paid for by taxpayers' money. So taxpayers have a right to know how higher education is going to benefit them. So that's one part of the argument, the, the kind of accountability to taxpayers. But we are not just saying accountability. We're saying something more than that. We're saying that what will be taught in postgraduate physics or what will be taught in postgraduate education studies, this decision must go through social dialogue and people must contribute to the decision-making on whether quantum physics should be taught and given importance or space physics should be taught and given importance. Yeah. And that, so keep that on the one side, how we may be making decisions about, for example, you might say, oh, but society doesn't even know what is quantum physics or space physics. They will not even be well positioned to have an opinion about these matters. Should people have opinions about things of which they don't know very much? Maybe they can say that, look, you might get educated, but ultimately you need to be able to get a job. But what should be included? Maybe something which is still an open question and we may not be readily willing to accept that society will, is well positioned to make those decisions. Let's look at school education uh, on the other side. Uh, there we're talking about a compulsory schooling system in which the right to education is a part of the right to life. And so we're saying this is the right to life with dignity. Now, Jagan, uh, Chief Minister of Telangana, may well say that, look, 
I promised my voters English medium education and they voted me because they want me to make all the schools English medium. So in this particular decision, I'm very right in taking the, in making this curriculum decision, basically letting it be made by society. And experts might tell me that mother tongue is the best medium in which students will learn and understand. But society tells me that they want English to be the medium of education for their children. So clearly, uh, whether you are, um, Jagan's arguments cannot be easily dismissed. Uh, we may say that yes, parents know best what is required to be able to lead a life with dignity. And if they think that edu English medium education enables their children to lead lives with dignity, then we should listen to them carefully. But experts may come back and tell society that, look, of course we all want life with dignity, but it is very well possible for you to learn English better if you learned your mother tongue first. And society may turn back and say, look, show me when has that happened. Generations of our students have gone to Telugu medium schools and they have not been able to learn English and they're languishing and left behind. Now this debate to and fro is exactly what deliberation is about. Clearly experts will have to convince voters that there is merit in learning uh, Telugu and that the learning of English will be strengthened if the students were very well competent in, in their own mother tongue. You know, they may cite uh, bilingual education research on second language acquisition being strengthened when the first language is very strongly grounded. But on the other hand, parents may say that, look, that's all very well, but I cannot wait for you to figure out how you're going to teach English. My child is here today and I want to ensure that she or he has the best chance of advancement in life. So I'm not going to wait for you to make your decisions on this debate. And I want English medium right now. So clearly neither of these decisions on whether it's society or expert on the higher education side and whether it is society and experts in the school education side, clearly neither of these debates is very easily made. Uh, and nobody can just get away with saying that, look, I'm the expert and let me decide. Because many people are staking claims to influ influencing the curriculum construction process. And why? I mean, clearly education is related to how we envision society and imagine it. And each of us is deeply invested in what uh, the, the role that we expect education to play. And we are invested in that question for many, many levels as parents, as students, as experts, as politicians, as people who have an understanding of the abstract nature of society. All of us are invested in this question of education. And all of us are taking a claim to influencing the decision making process. And the point that Kumar makes is that this is how it should be. This is the character of good curriculum decision making in any democracy. And the deeper this debate is, the more wide it is and inclusive it is, the more the expert is willing to explain to the parent and the parent is willing to listen to the expert, the more that willingness is there, the debate will be deepened and we can arrive at a consensus with which we can work. And that is really what we mean by deliberative nature of curriculum decision making. And we can see that it is, I mean, we may feel that in certain areas, experts are much better positioned to decide. In medical education, we don't want society just coming up and having views on what, how engineers should be trained and how doctors should be trained because we feel there's too much that rides on it. Uh, we better be well grounded in science. We cannot allow non uh, other bases for these decisions to be made. So we may go with a more expert view on that. But in certain other areas of education, indeed, we may be very much in favor of going with what society decides. But clearly it's going to be different. If you are living in the United Arab Emirates, where, which is an Emirati, it's not a, it's not a democracy. The grounds of decision-making in that society are quite different. If you lived in Sri Lanka 30, 40 years ago, uh, Tamil, was not recognized as a national language. And it clearly had political fallouts, a certain language and a certain culture being uh, marginalized in, in the entire curriculum decision-making process. Uh, it led to a lot of political turmoil in that country. So 
all these are reflective of the political arrangements of society. And please don't ever think that curriculum decisions can be innocent and that they can be technologized and depoliticized. Deeply they are political. In fact, uh, many people point, remember, especially for my parents' generation, they said, you know, we used to have a higher maths and lower maths. And those who could not do maths well, they could at least do lower maths and pass in school. Now, I don't know why they've imposed a single mathematics on everybody. Others point out that it was actually an unequal distribution of higher maths and lower maths opportunities. And disproportionately, students from government schools, students from rural areas used to be offered only lower maths. And students from urban areas and private schools used to have the option of studying higher maths. So effectively, opportunities were getting politically distributed unevenly in society. So even decisions that seem to be so obviously good play out in very complex and different ways through the political arrangements of a society. So the point being that it's corely political and that is how it will be. It's not a problem that it's political. It is the character of this entire domain that it will be political. Um, I want to just get back to this question of uh, the majority decisions. Um, and in any democracy, um, this is one of the key concerns that is at the core of a democracy. This is also the reason why Plato uh, was very, very suspicious of democracy. He said, if we start thinking that democracy means the majority voice will hold, then there's a problem with that. Because that is not what democracy actually promises. Democracy doesn't say that the majority voice is the best decision. It's certainly one way in which decisions are made, but it is actually always the last resort to go with the majority voice. It's only when we are not able to arrive at consensus, not able to accommodate diverse points of view in the vision of what we create. It's only then when we, when in fact the ability to build consensus, when that breaks down, that's when we resort to majoritarianism. Clearly a problem and an indication that democracy is not in a very healthy state. If we cannot have social dialogue, deliberate, negotiate, give and take, persuade other peoples. If you can't do this and we just go with what the majority decides, then we will have a problem with uh, the democracy becoming the tyranny of the majority, imposing one way of life of the majority on everybody else. And this is certainly something which we should be very vigilant about in any democracy because ultimately democracy is proposed as a political arrangement basically to ensure that everybody enjoys their liberties that we are democratic because we think that democracy is the best way to ensure justice social economic and political Democracy is the best way to ensure that there is liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, which is clearly not a statement in favor of majoritarianism. We also believe that it is in a democracy that we can actually ensure equality of status and of opportunity, that we can actually persuade people who have to give up and disproportionately give to those who don't that we can arrive at consensus that opportunities in society should be distributed to favor those who are marginalized and more unequal. And we believe that it is in a democracy that we can ensure the dignity of individuals along with the unity of nation. Yeah. So the democratic arrangement of polity is um, chosen as a political arrangement to facilitate us to achieve these, which are the core things that we value. And this, each of these terms that were picked up and included in the, con in the preamble of the constitution are really the articles of faith. They are the articles, this is, this is the virtue matrix of, of our political life, uh, which is supposed to inform the way we function together as a, as a community. Uh, do note that the 
the dignity of the individual is very central. We are not saying here that we ensure the protection of all cultures in India. We are not saying in this preamble that we will ensure that opportunity must be distributed on lines of gender or language or caste. The constitution is not laying out the, the communitarian nature in which some of our responses have been organized. Uh, it is basically a liberal constitution, which is uh, a belief that every individual counts, regardless of the culture from they come, they come from, the language that they speak, the gender that they have, regardless, every individual counts. And the individual's dignity is what we must ensure that the entire system works to protect. The individual's ability to find justice, seek the li individual's liberty, uh, freedom to enjoy thought, expression, belief, faiths, follow whatever faith they wish. And the individual's ability to uh, improve their own uh, status, access opportunity, and the system to ensure that these opportunities are more equal that just because you are born into a more privileged family or speak a particular language, uh, it doesn't mean that those who don't automatically begin to suffer inequalities in society. And so this is the vision of the, the constitution of India. And basically education plays a role in cultivating these underlying values. Everything that we do in education, ultimately, especially in the area of compulsory education, but most certainly in higher education as well, it has to be aligned to furthering these core uh, political and social values that the Indian constitution um, gives to us, we give to ourselves. So I want to just spend a little bit more time on uh, this unit, uh, which is forefronted in the Indian constitution, which is the unit of uh, the individual. Uh, this is definitely, uh, I would say it's, it's the, the central tenet or idea which uh, this the political philosophical position, which we call liberalism, uh, identified and abstracted. Uh, and it comes from the rights of man. The, you know, I think some of you may be familiar with the enlightenment philosophy the kind of breakaway of, uh, from, from the church, the separation of the church from the state, and the increasing uh, recognition that um, rights of man need to be enjoined upon every, on every man. I mean, it's the rights of humans, because actually at the time that rights of man was formulated, not every society necessarily regarded this as uh, rights of men and women, but that's how we read it today. Uh, it's a recognition that all human beings have the right to freedom and need freedom. And this means really absence of constraint and freedom to make meaningful choices uh, with equitable and just distribution of material resources, which enable us to achieve uh, our freedoms and enables us to make meaningful choices. And human well-being is understood from an individual point of view. In fact, one of the tenets of, of one of the fights of liberalism was to free individuals from the tyranny of the cultures from which they can, came. It is almost as if communities and cultures claimed, or religions for that matter, claimed individuals and said, your first identity is your identity as a person of this particular faith or a speaker of this particular language, or belonging to this particular region of the country, and then you are who you are. Liberalism was a fight to actually break the human out of this kind of tyranny and um, sub becoming totally subsidiary to the context, community to which, from which you came. And it uh, made strong argument in favor of recognizing the individual's autonomy and uh, recognizing the rights and the ability of everybody to engage, explain, articulate, make choices, and defend one choices. So even if you're a, you're a girl, you're a, it doesn't mean that you're somehow less capable of making decisions about what is right for you in, in matters of what you're going to study, 
or how you want to dress. Uh, your family cannot say that, look, you're a girl, you don't know what is good enough for you. Let me make that decision for you. So very often cultures, religions, linguistic groups, family groups, they don't make, they don't take away these freedoms from us, uh, claiming that we are subsidiary to them. They often do it with, in the best of intent. It's often with this argument that we know what is best for you. So let us make these choices. We've lived longer in this earth, on this earth. We know what will, the problems that you will encounter if you go down that path and not this path. So often freedoms are taken away paternalistically. Uh, but liberalism is a kind of safe, is, is a position from which we become vigilant about uh, this kind of well-being, compromising of people's freedoms and cho choice-making uh, opportunities. Uh, and liberalism basically uh, um, recognizes that everybody has the right to do what they want to do, say what they want to say, unless it harms others. If it places it, it can, if they, if it harms themselves, then there's really no argument against uh, and that. If they want to poke their nose and uh, inflict pain on themselves, liberalism will not interfere with that type of choice. But harming others, liberal, that's the line that liberalism basically draws. That you have freedom to do what you want to do and think and say what you want to say, but this freedom stops short of your. You don't have the freedom to harm others. That's really the promise of liberalism. And it, it's very individual focused. Please the individual from the control and restrictions that uh, communities particularly place on, uh, on individuals. Now, liberalism was a very important political development of the 1900s. It, be, it began to take shape right from the writings of Rousseau and others. You, you recognize the seeds of this understanding of the individual and this articulation of the rights of individuals. And then it develops into a full-fledged uh, philosophy, which is not only something which is enshrined in the constitution, but it is also something that was deeply important and recognized And people like Tagore, uh, Gandhi. We find forms of liberalism expressed, Ambedkar, Pule, uh, and feminists, uh, forms of liberalism, that basic philosophical political position being worked out in many of these uh, philosophers as well. Um, so uh, we may say that, look, if the focus is on the individual, then what is the justification of affirmative action on grounds of gender or caste? I mean, is the Indian constitution justified in reserving one third of all seats in particular in constituencies at the local board for women? Is it correct in ensure uh, of uh, yeah, reserving Sarpanch positions for women? Should there be that kind of affirmative action, reserving positions on grounds of caste or grounds of gender or grounds of uh, minority rights? I mean, should minority institutions be given special privileges to run their own institutions? Uh, and why can't, if, and if, if truly, if we believe in the individual, then why don't we give, let all individuals get whatever they want? What, how can we restrict admission based on merit or conducting entrance tests? If somebody wants to study medicine, they should be allowed to. That's what it really means to respect individual freedoms and choices. Everybody should do whatever they want and be able to do, pursue it as long as it doesn't harm others. Now, liberalism is clearly located within society here and now. It's not functioning in some utopia in the future where we have infinite resources. And always it's a question of how do we distribute opportunity? If there's so much resource that we have, how shall we distribute it? Should we make education compulsory to grade eight or grade 10? The people will tell you, well, it's a function of what the GDP is. If we can afford it, let's increase it. Yeah. So some of these decisions on how societies ultimately get structured is based upon the resources that are available to be redistributed. And some of these are to protect societies, democratic societies from becoming majoritarian. And some of them derive from uh, a liberal theory of justice in which um, we have to adjust for 
inequalities that have got built into society uh, and address them af actively through affirmative action. So if society has already got deep stratification on gender and caste lines, then there may be a very strong argument made to provide affirmative action on grounds of caste and gender. The point is that yes, societies adapt and try to provide the best possible arrangement through which we can make um, a more equitable uh, choice. We can offer more equitable choices and freedoms to everybody. And these, uh, and the shape that every polity takes really depends on the kind of inequalities that have already got built into that society from generations, historical generations, and um, the current position of different social groups. So even a liberal constitution will have to account for and enable these things to happen. But the point is that a liberal constitution will have to build the arguments and justifications for each of these. Just because you get elected doesn't automatically give you rights to go and start changing things and in creating new laws. You have to justify them all the time. And you can be asked to justify it and ex demand explanation. I think that's really what uh, the democratic process ensures within the liberal framework. One of my favorites, some of you might remember that last year, there was a 17 year old girl in Chennai. She went to Jailine, saying that her father uh, took away her mark sheets and was preventing her from joining a course of her choice. She wanted to study journalism. Her father wanted her to do BSc chemistry and become a teacher. Was he a very bad and mean father? It actually happens that the father and mother were separated. So was he being mean to her? No. On the contrary, he was very fond of her and he believed strongly in her academic credentials and possibilities. He just felt that it was actually not the best thing for her to do. And it would be much better for her to pursue science rather than art. So he took away her certificates because he didn't want her to do, make a bad choice. He felt she was not mature enough to make the right choice. And here was this young girl who went to a child line and said, look, this is taking away my rights. Yeah. So this is one of those I mean, it's a great example of exactly how um, this, the liberal framework plays out in, in societies like ours, in which uh, there is a lot of value that we place on institutions like family, uh, or language groups, religious groups. We place a lot by these institutions. But at the same time, all of us, especially all of us women, know how much we have gained from the liberal imagination. Many of the things that we are doing today, we would never have been able to do it if our families and our religious groups and our linguistic groups continued the way they used to in the past. And this is a form of life that we don't want to give up very easily. We think there's enormous value and justification in these achievements of the liberal of the liberal framework. So please don't very quickly uh, set aside liberalism as being too individualistic. It's more complicated than that. And, and we are very, many of us are very grateful that we have this opportunity to realize our own uh, individualist, uh, individual, individual capabilities. So I want to just place for you what the basic tension then is and why the question of culture keeps coming back. And while many of us are grateful for the um, break in the tyranny of cultures and majoritarianism that liberalism has provided us, while we are grateful for that, at the same time, we also value and cherish our cultures deeply. So let me just present to you the key uh, formulation that Rajiv Bhargav provides to us, which heightens this tension. And this is around the question of identity. Now, um, what Rajiv, Bhargav, and even the liberals, I mean, everybody says that, look, the whole pursuit of the freedoms to develop ourselves, realize all our talents, the pursuit of all that really enables us to develop our own identities as unique individuals. And this is very, very central. So liberals want freedoms because through the 
exercise of freedoms and choice making, we're able to develop our potentials. Like, you know, if somebody is very talented at something, we want them to develop their talent and become known for that particular talent. If somebody is very good at calligraphy, we want them to develop the talent and be known as a brilliant calligraphist. If somebody is good at storytelling, we want them to develop that capacity to become excellent and be known as a great storyteller. So in the liberal imagination, our identities come from our unique capabilities at which we and our, it's almost our duty to pursue our unique capabilities and develop and excel in them. And liberalism wants us to find out who we are from what we can do, what are our skills and capabilities. Not I'm the daughter of X and Y, I speak this language, I am a person of this faith. Liberals say, look, all those are how culture gives you identity. You must realize who you are from your own unique uh, capabilities and your own creativity. That's your uh, vocation as a human being to pursue and develop your individuality. Communitarians on the other hand, and the communitarian philosophy says, look, that's all very well, but let's not forget that stable identities come from belongingness and cultural communities. And cultural communities provide us with the commitments and the identifications, the framework from which we can recognize what is good, what is valuable, what should be done, what is society all about, what is the life worth living, that these beliefs are social ineluctably social. They belong in communities. And the sense of identity comes from embeddedness in particular communities. And the point that Bhargav makes is that we cannot even become totally conscious of everything that we get from our communities. But the belongingness in community is really the source of very, very fundamental aspects of our identity. So. I built the argument strongly for the idea of liberalism because it's an important achievement of the Indian constitution. Uh, and we can recognize how liberalism presents the development of identity. And liberalism clearly doesn't want to rest on what culture gives you. It wants you to realize who you are, not simply because of a community that you belong to or a language that you speak. You're not just an inheritor of your identity. You have to create it from your own capabilities and potentials. Communitarians, on the other hand, communitarian philosophers say, look, that's all very well. But actually, it is this deep belongingness in a community, which is a source of identity forming beliefs that are so deep that, in fact, you may not even be able to articulate it in your language. It's present in your consciousness, but it's not out there that you can slate out there and examine it and debate on it. So that's the position of the communitarians that identity is a much more deep and complex thing. So even while we seek and pursue individual goals, and we value that very much, at the same time, uh, we cannot set aside the question of the cultures from which uh, our identities get formed and the cultures to which we have a sense of belongingness. That's really the tension of uh, culture and, uh, and um, liberalism, the communitarian position and the liberal position. These are clearly not in an easy relationship with each other. And there is this core tension that we should be picking up and uh, examining. Uh, and I, it would be really good if I could engage with some of your questions. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Padma. Uh, we have some questions in the Q&A. So, so the first question is, is identity of a person only dependent upon a particular community walls or surrounding does matter? So I think that is a good question because, you know, identity... Uh, when you say surrounding, I think what you're saying is that we can some simultaneously be members of multiple communities and not just one. Uh, so sometimes these communities may be nested. So our family may be within a particular locality or a caste group. It could move in either direction. And sometimes these are nested uh, communities. Sometimes they're actually intersecting communities like in a Venn diagram. 
So we may be simultaneously members of a particular uh, tribal group, and we may also be speakers of a language which is shared with others. So we may be um, have membership in intersecting communities as well. And also, you're absolutely right that communities are not static, they're dynamic spaces. So yes, communities are in constant interaction with society, responding, changing, evolving. They're not things of the past. They're actually very dynamic spaces. Okay. Uh, the next question is, why are we separating the panel as society and experts when the experts are also part of society and they could be parents themselves? Yeah. Uh, you're right, experts are in society, but the position of being an expert is different from the position of being a citizen. Yeah? In, when you're an expert, you claim authority to speak based on a particular knowledge base that you hold. So you may speak as an expert of psychology. You may speak as an expert in physics. When you're a citizen, your considerations are different. You're not speaking from a knowledge vantage point. You're not claiming expertise when you speak as a citizen. You're claiming rights of a different kind from the position of being a member of society. And in fact, uh, people may say that those who are not citizens of a society don't have a voice in that society. And then you will find people will claim the vantage point to speak by making arguments about uh, being speaking for human rights. So we can even find um, people from outside the country um, using the blank of human rights to gain voice. So in each, from each position that we speak, we gain the authority to speak from uh, uh, evoking something about our position from which we speak. So the positions are different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, is democracy against uh, standardization and consistency and what is the process to attain consensus? Yeah. So democracy is actually the best solution to ensure that we don't become standardized. This is Mill's proposal. He says that, look, standardization is what kills any society. And the more variety and variation we have in a society, the healthier it will be. And the more possibility there are for new things to come about. And democracy is the best solution to ensure that kind of non-standardization. So absolutely, democracy is not a formula for standardization at all. However, we just need to have working consensus. So democracy gives everybody the right to be different, but we have, there are some things on which we need to agree. So we need to be able to agree on what will inform our public life. We need to agree upon what will inform the way in which we interact with each other. For example, we have to all agree on how much of our money, how much of our income can be taxed. Yeah, that, is, that can be arrived at only through a democratic process. Okay. So we want the right to spend the money that we earn, but we will all agree on how much of this can go as the, into the common kitty of the, of the government. So that's the kind of only uh, consensus building that democracy favors. So we can have more, uh, we can have thin democracy. We can have more, not thin, thin democracy. We can have thin states in which in the democratic process, there are very few things that the state will do. Or we can have more thick uh, welfare oriented states in which the state is actually given a lot more right to interfere even in the private lives of individuals. And there are varieties of democratic arrangements that we can have. But this is the, like a founding principle in democracy indeed. And it is uh, supposed to be a good arrangement to ensure maximization of individual freedoms. Uh, thanks a lot for this insightful session, Padma. Uh, Thank you. Yeah.